Hello, welcome to Herb Corner, where we'll be discussing the Calibur Python, also known as Calibari Rain Hardy, or the Calibar Burrowing Boa, or the Ground Boa. Now, hold on a second, right? They can't be both a python and a boa, so what the hell are they? Well, they're boas. Thing is, there's a lot of debate on where they're categorized. They're currently in the category of Ericene, which is a subfamily of non-venomous sand boas. Think Canyon Sand Boa. That's also under debate though, and this might be hard to understand for some newcomers, but I'll try my best. So the Calibar Python scientific name is Calibaria reinhardi, right? Calibaria is the genus. For them to be considered Ericinae, their genus would need to be Eryx. Note that some herpetologists re refer to them with that genus. The reason they're not that is because their evolution is judged to be too divergent from any other sambo to be categorized with them. Does that make sense? I might have gotten a few things wrong there, I'm not a taxonomy guy, but that's my understanding of it. In fact, the taxonomy of this animal is so confusing that they're listed with not one, not two, but six different scientific names, all with different genuses. This guy's a mess! Confusion on the python boa thing stems mostly from us being confused on how to categorize the species. It's semantics, basically. Semantics and evolution weirds. Okay. Semantics, evolution weirds, and the fact that they're one of three species of boas that can actually lay eggs. Most boas give live birth, but calabar pythons lay clutches of two or three eggs. I'll stick to calling them the calabar python throughout the video for consistency and understandability, but it'll be okay, because you and I know the real truth. Either way, the calabar python is a dark brown snake with orange speckles throughout their body. They have black eyes and a bulbous tail in the same shape as their head, of course, meant to confuse predators. They grow to no more than 2 or 3 feet snout to vent, and live up to 20 or 25 years. The actual scales of the snake are around 15 times thicker than most burrowing snakes. Even under the scales lies incredible thick skin, comparable to a rhinoceros. It's thought that they evolved this as a protection against the rodents they eat. The caliber python invades rodent burrows and feasts on the babies inside. They evolved hard to pierce skin as defense against the mother's teeth. Caliber pythons were discovered in 1851 by Hermann Schlegel, a German herpetologist, ichthyologist, and ornithologist. Since then, they've been consistently elusive making it incredibly difficult for anyone to study their behaviors. Their specific epithet, Reinhardi, was coined in reference to the Danish herpetologist Johannes Theodore Reinhardt. They're native to central West Africa, including Liberia, Côte d'Ivoire, Ghana, Togo, Nigeria, and Cameroon. You can mostly find them in rainforests loose soil, which sets them apart from most other burrowing boas. Most of them are native to dry, sandy areas. Caliber pythons are used to humid areas, even if the land itself isn't humid, the underground area of it is. They're primarily fossorial, so the overall climate of the surface doesn't mean very much for their overall care. Fossorial means the animal is underground dwelling. When it comes to the care of the caliber python, it's very similar to that of a ball python. Overall, they're a pretty good beginner snake, Behaviorally, they have a lot of similarities with ball pythons and rosy boas. This snake makes a terrific educational animal for presentations due to their mellow nature. Like ball pythons, they curl up into a ball in your hand. A 20 or 25 gallon long terrarium works fine for them. Make sure that the tank comes with some kind of secure lid. If it's a sliding lid, you don't have to worry about it. But if it's one of the uh, lifty ones, you, you gotta secure it with books, rocks, or just something heavy. Not super heavy, just something moderately sized other than the heat lamp. And I say this because these snakes are very strong. Not like choke you strong, but they could lift a lid if it was light enough. Even though they mostly burrow, provide them with some kind of climbing enrichment. This could be any anything from a few twigs to, I don't know, get creative. Generally, with burrowing animals, it's good to provide a little something extra since they're not always just sitting in a hole in the wild. They scavenge for food. Even though I wouldn't recommend dropping a live rodent in the enclosure for them to find, I'd still recommend leaving some sort of something for them to climb around on and explore. For example, my Kenyan Sambo, who is pretty closely related to Calabar pythons, utilizes the plastic tree I give her all the time. That and it's, I don't know, kind of fun to watch an animal use all the space you give them. So long as you've got the space for it in your enclosure, it's a good idea. Other than that, a hide should be provided, even if it's not used much. Something like a plastic log would do. 
For substrate, I'd recommend exoterra plantation soil with a drainage layer. Drainage layers are important because for high humidity environments like this enclosure, the moisture can build up in the soil and grow mold. Good loose dirt is a necessity for this species. Paper towels and reptile carpets are not acceptable alternatives. Neither is sand since they don't since they need a lot of humidity and stand molds easily. Be sure to also have some kind of live plant available and a colony of isopods to aerate the soil. Any kind of small maiden's hair ferns or a small ficus would do fine. Clown isopods or zebra isopods work well. A temperature gradient in the enclosure is necessary, with the hot spot being 88 to 93 degrees Fahrenheit. Overall, the enclosure's ambient temperature should be around 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Some would suggest using a heat pad over a heat lamp, but some ball pythons have been studied to bask, and I know my Kenyan Samboa basks from time to time, so I personally like using heat lamps more. Basking also helps reptiles digest faster. And speaking of which, the caliber python should be fed on a diet of small rodents, mostly hopper mice. The mice can be dusted with calcium powder, but that's not really needed. When they're babies, they can be fed on fuzzy mice. Of course, a water bowl should be provided with the typical dechlorinated water that I always suggest. Any water bowl that's deep enough to house a decent amount of water, but shallow enough so that they won't drown is good. Getting your hands on a caliber python is the hard part. Easier than most other species we've covered, but still difficult. There are a few online stores that ship caliber pythons for usually around $180. Also, hi John Underground Reptiles, great to see you. I haven't found a single website that sells captive bred specimens, so if you're looking to get one, I'd recommend only do so if your main intent is breeding. When it comes to breeding, the caliber python is slightly more difficult than most other boas in that they require egg incubation. Though some articles have described the species as difficult to breed, they justify that by saying they need to provide plenty of food and water, which one, isn't difficult to provide, and two, that's the same with almost every snake species if not all. On every front other than egg incubation, they're around average in their breeding difficulty, despite the, compared to most snakes, small clutch size of two to five eggs, getting your snake to actually produce said eggs isn't difficult. There's very little known complications with calibre pythons, and, and while that could be chalked up to a general lack of breeding for these animals, it could be that the animal is simply easy to breed. Sand boas, rosy boas, and the like are all very simple in their breeding rituals. You pair up a male and a female, and overnight they'll usually have bred. Granted, there are still some factors that need to be sorted out, but it's a very simple process. Calabar pythons usually breed in late winter or early spring, similarly to Kenyan sand boas. You should wait at least two years for your female to mature before breeding, and at least one year for your male. Once they're both at the breeding age, they can be paired up for mating. Make sure to leave an egg box in the enclosure while they uh, get busy. An egg box is some kind of box, plastic usually, could be Tupperware, with a lot of humidity on the inside. A lot of reptile keepers will usually fill the box with sphagnum moss. Check the egg box a day or two after pairing them up together. If there are eggs in the egg box, transfer them into your incubator. Incubators are super diverse in terms of appearance and functionality. I've never personally used one, but I know they can cost anywhere from $60 to $170. Do additional research when considering buying an egg incubator for reptile eggs. I'm aware some reptile people have made their own incubators from scratch, so look into that too. But that's going to be all for this installment of Herb Corner. As always, sources will be in the description. This was an especially short episode today because of a lack of information. Don't worry about it. If you're interested in the topic, I'd recommend looking further into their husbandry or history. If you learned something new with this one, feel free to subscribe. I do these every other week. Have a good evening, morning, or afternoon. Thank you for listening, watching, whatever, and I'll see you next time.